Welcome back to the lab. Don't you just hate it when you roll out of bed, stumble into the shop, connect your circuit to a cheap electronic load you got from Alibaba, and just boom, explodes into a fiery ball of slag? Well, me too. So that's why we're building a better electronic load for the hobbyist. <laughs> a critical part of not turning into a molten, fiery ball of slag are protective circuits. We just designed over current protection for our electronic load project. So let's see if we can hook over voltage protection into this design as well. Let's round this out. We laid some great groundwork in that previous video, but I really don't want to design this circuit in a vacuum. I don't think that will go well for us in the long run. So let's imagine for a moment that instead of two individual comparators, we're using one dual comparator. So one physical part that has two comparators within it, okay? If that's what we're using, then we know one thing. We know that those two comparators will be physically close to one another. They're on the same die, they're in the same package. It's, yeah, okay. So we've got two comparators right next to it. And if that's the case, that means that our voltage reference could very probably be shared. We talked about one thing, the uh, very small voltage that we're comparing for the overcurrent threshold relatively small current. And basically what that means is that um, we needed to divide down our two and a half volt reference. That is not the case for over voltage protection because we have complete control over how we divide this down. Obviously we are not going to connect 100 volts up to 100 volts to this comparator. We're going to divide that down to a small signal. So let's decide what voltage level makes sense. And let's see if we can reuse that voltage reference. So if you didn't pick up on that, that means that we're going to try to use two and a half volts as our reference to say that very explicitly. And you can see that while this looks similar, this, this is pretty much the exact same simulation. Just now, instead of over current protection, we have over voltage protection. I've removed the over current protection and left over voltage protection. All right, you can see that we've got our same shunt voltage reference. We're tapping two and a half volts off, and we've got a 40K upper resistor tied to V in, and then a 1K resistor on the lower. Now, a voltage divider is not usually something that I would spend a lot of time talking about, but this video is really short on content, so I just need a little. This voltage divider is something special. When we're building something for the channel, I typically use 0603 resistors. Why is that? Well, they're pretty easy for me to solder by hand. I don't really need to think about it at this point. I can work with 0201s or 0402s, but I really got to get out the tweezers. Eventually, you really need a microscope, and I just... I want to be able to see them with my own eyes and just solder them on the board and rework them. And I like that they're a little bigger. And also the fact they're larger makes it relatively difficult to rip pads off the board if you need to add a few blue wires while still having pretty good density. I think they're a pretty nice balance of size and um, like minimizing size and maximizing the ability to work with them by hand. They're small, but not too small. See, but there's only one problem with being small. And specifically, this application exposes that. Well, they're small. <laughs> what? What? That sounds silly. Yes. Um, basically, that means that if you apply too much voltage across this physically small component, there comes a point where it can just arc across or creep underneath, you'll start to leak current in ways that the part was not designed to. It no longer functions like an ideal resistor. And for an 0603, that limit is very typically 50 volts, very often 50 volts. So if we used one 40K resistor, if that existed, we would be overstressing that component. Potentially, it would fail as a short circuit, blow up a bunch of stuff downstream. That would be a pretty bad time, but thankfully, Resistors are very easy to use in series. If we just use multiple 10K or 20K resistors to build that 40K resistor, we can get by that maximum voltage limit. You basically put a resistor divider inside of your resistor divider at the cost of adding more component tolerance. So you maybe you start to drift a little further, but ignoring that for a moment gets us around that 50 volt limit when we're applying 100 volts 
So in our final design, I expect you'll see two 20K resistors in series instead of one 40K resistor, and that is why. Uh, just so you know, this resistor divider results in a nominal threshold of 102.5 volts, so that's uh, just about 10% more than that 90 volt threshold. All right, that is about all that I can say about an overvoltage threshold without kicking the tires on this design. So let's run the simulation and see that it works as expected. Okay, so I think we have almost identical inputs to the system. Let's just make sure. What do we have for a voltage input? We've got, yep, basically the same thing. And we've got a current signature that will look very different. Now you can see there's no overcurrent protection. There's no clamp. So when we apply that load step, we see a peak of 120 amps and a much longer transient. Um, yeah, so basically what we see is we are above our 10 amp set point for about 13 milliseconds with a peak of 120 amps. That would blow up our FET for sure. That demonstrates the value of our overcurrent protection. But now let's say somebody, some, some person did not understand the limits of this electronic load. It happens, happens to the best of us. And they try to apply 200 volts to the input. Now there comes an absolute threshold where this thing will just blow up no matter what you do, right? There's a maximum limit to how much voltage that FET can withstand. If you exceed it, it will blow up but it's a much higher voltage than what we can allow while we're passing significant power. And so here's what happens. The voltage goes up to 200 volts. Whenever it crosses above our 100 volt threshold, we end up clamping the gate of our FET to negative 15 volts. So basically, you can see the voltage increases, and let's see if I can get this on one plot pane here so we can see it crossing that threshold. Yes, there, you can see that perfectly. So our voltage starts at about zero volts. It starts to go up, go up, go up, go up. And once we get above, look at that, 104 volts. And I mean, that's the accuracy of a cursor. So sure, we'll call that 102 volts. We'll say that's pretty close to the nominal rating. 104 volts, it turns off. So we get a little bit of a current transient but it's significantly shorter just because, oops, we've got that over voltage protection. Excellent. But of course, it doesn't stop there. I just want to plot this with the transient just to know. This is dependent on the rate of rise on the um, input voltage, depends on when you cross. But uh, this, in this case, it made it a few microseconds, five, five and a half is what it shows. Okay, that's neat. That's pretty fun, but there's more to this than that. I'm going to apply 200 volts as that square wave. We're gonna have the overcurrent, the overvoltage. See they're in parallel here. There's a diode going to each of those protective circuits. And for now we should trigger both of the protections every now and again. Also, if you apply this waveform to my electronic load, I'm going to have some words for you, because this is abuse. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay, so how does the current waveform look? Okay. So here's what we see. We see that there is an overvoltage event. And for as long as that overvoltage event occurs, the current is clamped to zero. Okay. Makes sense. If there's too much voltage applied, we will very likely violate the safe operating area of the FET. Best turn off. We could make that throw an error if we brought that signal back, but for now I think we'll just ride through silently and deal with it. After that fault timer expires, you see that when we're back down at 100 volts for long enough, that does just auto recover, turn back on, and that's fantastic. Um, then when our load disappears and comes back, when the, oh my goodness, when it, wow. So we have a voltage transient for a moment. And when that happens, you see we trip the overcurrent protection and then it recovers. 
That's pretty cool. And if we uh, take a look down here, if we take a look at the overcurrent protection out, the overvoltage protection out, you can see when these circuits are functioning. The overcurrent protection triggers at that one instant. The overvoltage protection triggers whenever we're applying more than 100 volts. We end up with a logical or, as it were, a logical or between overvoltage and overcurrent protection. That is the goal. That is what we are really, truly shooting for. We're trying to build a electronic load. We're trying to build an electronic load that can handle over voltage events as long as they're within reasonable bounds. We want to build an electronic load that can withstand over current events. And by combining the over current protection that we just talked about in our last video, we compared that back with the safe, with the safe operating area curve for our MOSFET. We were well within those limits. Now we go and add the voltage protection, which keeps it within that limit. So now if you apply a uh, over voltage, it won't blow up. If you apply an over current, it won't blow up. You see that we have a placeholder for our reverse polarity protection. I have been really wrestling with that because I have seen, I have used electronic loads in the past that specifically don't have over a reverse polarity protection. And we could implement that with basically just a fuse because you will enhance the body diode of the FET and we would blow a fuse. So maybe we just add a fuse, maybe we add a diode, maybe we add a current shunt in parallel with a diode. <sighs> Haven't decided yet, but we'll do something, that's for sure. Regardless, regardless, I'm feeling pretty good about these protective circuits. I'm feeling pretty good about where this design is and I'm excited for what's next. If you like this video and you can't wait for more, let me know by getting subscribed, hitting that like button, and leaving a comment down below. Coming up soon, we will be tuning the compensation network that we've been playing around with for the last few videos and building this system up in KiCad. KiCad? KiCad. I can't wait. If you want to support the channel, consider checking out our Patreon page as well, or there's some other links in the description. There's a link to this simulation file, so make sure to check that out. Thank you to those that have decided to become a Patreon member, though. It really does help us out a lot. Thank you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching E for Everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!